Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Rubin Museum here in New York City. In this very special edition of the Pace Report, you're going to witness the unveiling ceremonies of the Edith Piaf as well as the Miles Davis Forever stamp presented by the United States Postal Service. Tonight, members of the Piaf estate as well as the Davis family will be giving special speeches as well as presentations and the unveiling of the stamp. Tonight, you're also going to witness special comments and remarks from people who worked with Miles throughout his career. George Avakian, the legendary record producer, as well as Ron Carter, as well as his nephew, Vince Wilborn. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this very special edition of the Miles Davis and Edith Piaf stamp forever unveiling by the United States Postal Service tonight here at the Rubin Museum here in New York City. It is such an honor to be here to help honor one of my heroes and to dedicate a new postage stamp to two of the greatest musicians of the 20th century, Edith Piaf and Miles Davis. Now we're going to hear uh, some great stories about Miles, I'm sure, and I'd like to start off with one of my own. In fact, Vince Wilburn, uh, Miles' nephew, who I've known for 30 years, insisted I tell this story. When I was uh, very young, my folks had a record store. My mom says I was four or five, I think I was a little older, but she owned the, uh, we owned the, the record store on the west side of Chicago. Zip code was 60623 for all you postal workers. <laughs> and um, a guy walked in with a gun with a woman, and he stood, had the gun at my mom's side, had directed the woman to what to take, I was underneath the gun, and on the 45 single, remember 45s? On our record player was the Miles Davis single, If I Were a Bell, where he starts, I play it now, tell you what it is later. <laughs> then he rings, the, the, the bells ring, he states the theme, he solos, Red Garland solos, then it's a 45 single. As Coltrane comes on, it fades, it rejects, it goes back, I play it now, tell you what it is later. And it was like seven times. And from that moment on, five or six, I felt that Miles Davis protected me all my life. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is very, a very special and personal honor for me. Um, I was really small when, when Mom got started in the jazz business, but I knew throughout my whole life that Miles was really instrumental, and he was a great friend, and I, I wanted to share a couple stories, too. 
Okay, and I gotta set the tone now. I get, give you a little history lesson. This was back in the early 60s. Mom's in her mid 20s. Uh, she's got one album out so far, Embers and Ashes. And we're, and I'm, I'm way down here. <laughs> Not important. So we're visiting my, my uh, grandmother, my father's mother in Southern Virginia, way in the country. And, and we're just, you know, spending time. Well, my grandmother gets a phone call and she tells my mom, Miles Davis is on the phone. And of course, mom didn't believe it. She thought somebody was playing a prank, but it really was. Miles, and mom has said to this day, she never knew how he tracked her down, way down in Virginia, but he contacted her. He told her he wanted her to come to New York. He gave her a ticket. She came to the home, and to, to, for her to know that he was really serious, had been listening to her music, she said that the kids were running around singing some of Miles Davis' songs. So I'm really looking forward to meeting the children to see if they have that same recollect recollection, because I've heard that story many, many times. Okay. Um, Miles, one of the early things that Miles did was he negotiated for mom to open up for him at the Village Vanguard Club here in New York. And so when mom was performing, she shared that uh, that, that performance at the same time was the opening of a raisin in the sun. So as she was looking out in the audience among all the stars, and I'm sure there were a lot, Sidney Poitier was sitting in the audience. So we're talking about she's once again in her mid-20s, really just playing in the D.C. area, but now all of a sudden she's got Miles Davis coaching her, helping her along, Sidney Poitier's on, in the audience, and also Quincy Jones was in the audience. So from that exposure, she ended up uh, um, recording them with Quincy Jones for a couple of albums. But um, So let me bring you forward then. That's a little history. Then if, a few uh, decades later, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to attend the concert while Miles was playing with moms in Philadelphia, and it, it was really awesome. So we're sitting in the dressing room, in mom's dressing room, and, and just, you know, just relaxing before the show, and all of a sudden there's a knock at the door, and in comes Miles Davis. Well, of course, I, I, did, I stopped breathing for a while. My jaw <laughs> fell on the floor. But once I caught, uh, you know, got comfortable again, and, and after I met him, I just kind of witnessed the, the interaction between them, and, and you could really feel the the love they have for one another, and they kind of reminded me of a, a, of small children, right? They were going back and forth between the dressing rooms and talking about music and talking about whatever else. Miles sketched a a, a picture for Mom, and uh, to uh, to Shirley with love, Miles, and that picture ended up being the cover for the uh, I Remember Miles CD, which was also the CD that Mom received a Grammy Award for, and as Marcus shared, he did perform on her title track on that. Um, Marcus. You Won't Forget Me, which is an awesome CD. <laughs> so, once again, all of this uh, is just very special, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So let's go on to the dedication. We have Ron Stroman, who is the Postal Service's Deputy Postmaster General. Mr. Stroman is the nation's second highest ranking postal executive. Uh, in his role, he helps to strengthen the Postal Service's relationship with the mailing industry and the customers that we serve each day. Mr. Stroman has also had a lead role in working with Congress to make sure that the Postal Service continues to serve America well into the future. Before joining the Postal Service last year, Mr. Stroman served as counsel on the Judiciary Committee of the United States House of Representatives. He also held other positions on Capitol Hill and at the Department of Transportation and the Government Accountability Office. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ron Stroman. And I gotta tell you what a special moment it is uh, for me uh, personally to, uh, to be here. I had to fight for this one, this dedication. A lot of people wanted to do it, and I had to pull a little rank to, to get here. Uh, as many of you uh, know, the Postal Service issues postal stamps to honor Americans' history and heritage. France follows a similar tradition, issuing stamps to commemorate its own culture. In this spirit, the United States and France are coming together today to honor two artists who made lasting contributions to our country. Miles Davis was one of the greatest innovators in jazz. 
Likewise, Edith Piaf, one of France's best-loved singers, became a household name here in America. These musical giants never performed alongside each other. Now, the United States Postal Service and France's La Poste are bringing them together on these stamps. This is the first time our countries have jointly issued a stamp since 1989, when we came together to honor the bicentennial of the French Revolution. Now, with our Miles Davis and Edith Piaf stamps, our goal is to encourage people to learn about these artists and legacies that they have left us. Miles grew up in East St. Louis and studied music here in New York. And I've got some descriptions of uh, the kind of music that he pioneered, but I'm not going to read those, uh, in part because he defies categories. <laughs> you know, I, I will tell one, one story. Um, I, my, uh, my family, they weren't really big jazz fans, and so the first time I Really, you know, you have these moments when, when something hits you. And I was in college, I was a freshman, I was visiting a friend of mine and was in a bookstore. And I was looking through books, and this song came on. And I had never, ever, ever in my life heard anything like this before. I mean, it just took me to a place that I just had never been. And I remember I went over to the um, young man who was there behind the, uh, the encounter. And I said, who is that? And he looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> and he smiled. <laughs> Smiles at us. And it was Sketches of Spain. And, you know, I have just, it, it, is, it is just something that you will never forget as long as I live. Uh, because like his, like all of you, his music has just takes you to another, really to another place. Uh, if he was anything, he was innovative. He was constantly experimenting with new sounds and styles. He once said, quote, I have to change, and it's like a curse. And I can tell you, uh, he, he may be a curse to him, but it's a blessing to all of us. Uh, and that blessing continues today, more than two decades after his death, the music of Miles Davis obviously is still with us. His 1959 masterpiece, which I'm sure we all have, Kind of Blue, remains the best-selling jazz album of all times. Uh, we also see the influence that he's had on many of the artists uh, today, and we're going to hear some of those. Um, we don't just see his legacy, we hear it. You hear it on the radios, you hear it on iPods, you hear it in rock and roll, you hear it in funk, you hear it in hip hop. And Miles Davis really helped to shape these genres and many, many more. He was obviously uh, an American original and his friends in France have described him this way. In 1991, just a few months before he died, he was honored by the French culture minister who memorably called Miles, quote, the Picasso of jazz. Uh, I would change that. I would say the William Johnson, William S. Johnson. <laughs> because it really was his African-American roots that helped to shape, really, you know, his sound, I believe. And he transcended that, but it was really the, that fundamental. Again, if you've seen Johnson's paintings, again, it just transforms you and takes you to a place uh, that you've never been. So I, I would, I, that's how I would modify it. Modify it. Uh, just as France loved Davis, Americans have come to love Edith Piaf. She grew up in the streets where she collected coins while her father, a circus acrobat, performed for onlookers. By the time she was a teenager, she had become a performer in her own right. She began singing in the streets, then moved to the clubs, then to the recording studio. Her unique sound and songs of heartbreak have been called the French equivalent of the blues. The force of Piaf's soulful delivery is probably best captured in her signature tune, La Vie en Ovos, a cheerful song about seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. Her other album, No Regrets, 
reflects the defiant spirit she brought to popular music on both sides of the Atlantic. Piaf began performing in the United States in the 1940s. It took a while for Americans to recognize her talent, but she persevered and became a household name. She toured the United States 10 times, making eight appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show, sang twice at Carnegie Hall. Her life ended much too soon. But the woman known as the Little Sparrow continues to cast a long shadow both here in the United States and in France. Tell me about the process of putting together the idea of putting a Miles Davis stamp out. Well, you know, we get literally hundreds and thousands of recommendations every single year. Uh, Miles got such overwhelming support uh, in our, uh, our, um, our uh, organization that he literally went faster than anyone else in terms of people who had been recommended. Uh, I think everyone recognizes that he really embodies the spirit of America in so many ways artistically. And so Miles Davis is just, um, I think really everyone has said, if we have to do any one stamp, if we could do just one stamp, it would be the Miles Davis stamp. And this year you also did it joint with Edith Piaf also. Yes, we did it jointly with Edith for a number of reasons. One is we've been trying to work more closely with different posts around the world. And because Miles has such a special affection for France, and France has such a special affection for him, we thought it was very appropriate to do this with Edith Piaf, who in her own right is just a phenomenal singer and who they both admired each other's work. So we thought it was just a terrific marriage between the two of them. What does this stamp do for the legacy of Miles Davis around yeah, the world? around the world. People will now be able to mail a stamp, see Miles, see that incredible artwork, and we hope learn more about his music and his life and his legacy. So we're very excited about it. This is something I hadn't expected to do. But uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will be glad and rejoice in it. Now, Miles Davis was not a religious person <laughs> or a church-going person. He probably would say that the Lord didn't have a blank, blank thing to do with <laughs> But I know that he did. Um, we talked about jokes earlier. And I have one that I would like to share. It's the one that looms in my mind every time I think about this man's warped humor. Very few people knew how funny Miles was. There were times when at the dinner table, and it was always at the dinner table, when we sat down to have dinner, that he would start talking about his past life and his friends. And I had me laughing so hard, I would be choking on my meal. And I've said to him too many times, I think that you have found a way to kill me without a weapon. Why do you always wait until we sit down to have dinner to tell me these jokes, trying to choke me to death? I have a co-star here that was with me in Russia, Jack Bates. And so... I really want to share this joke. When I was told that I had the job in the movie Bluebird and that it was going to be shot in Russia, I told Miles. And when something really serious hits him, he goes dead on you. You get no response. He'll get up, he'll walk away, and maybe he'll come back. So I went on 
with my preparation. I had to go out and do some shopping for it. I came back home and he had acquired a global map which he apparently had been studying while I was out. And he said to me, come here, sit down. <laughs> Dear no damn Russian, where the hell are you going? <laughs> He had been trying to find this little town that we were going to shoot in on the map. He couldn't find it. So he thought I was just taking off to go somewhere. All right, all right, get to Russia. Now there were very strict communication rules in Russia. There were certain times during the day that you could not get a call from the United States. Impossible, couldn't get through. I'm sitting in a restaurant at the hotel with Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, I hate to drop names, but they're the stars, and myself having lunch when I'm told by the concierge at the hotel that I had a phone call. And so I said, from whom? I don't know, it's from the United States. We can't get calls from the United States, it's impossible. Yes, there is one, so I got up. I get into the lobby, I pick up the phone. It's Miles Davis. I said, how in God's name did you know to do this? Nobody else could get through. How did you? When are you coming home? <laughs> As you know, he was a man of many facets. <laughs> many, many facets. And I have been blessed to benefit from most of them. Uh, I've heard people say that his music today is irrelevant. But I also listened to him play for a group of fourth grade students. And when he was finished, they were asked what they thought of his music. And you know, frequently he played with the mute on his horn. And one little girl stood up and she said, he sounds like a baby crying. He was a man who communicated through his music, through his music, you knew his physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual state. That's how he spoke to everyone. And that's why this man, and I have to interject this, when he passed away, my acting teacher called me and she asked, did he really know how much he was loved and I said, I don't think so. He kept reaching for that love for his music. Well, we all know now how much he loved and how relevant he is in the lives of everyone from infant to elder. Thank you so much. God bless you. top that. Um, I just want to start by saying a young boy in East St. Louis who used to go to school um, and he would spit rice, most of you probably know this, to uh, develop an embouchure. An embouchure is to, to um, for, your, for, for the mouthpiece for them to apply, to get a sound. And I was sitting there thinking, I, mean, I, I flashed back to trying to picture him walk along the tracks to school spinning this rice, and then the, the, um, the um, space to where we are now. So from that time to this, it's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. and, I'm th and then I'm trying to think about all the, all the in-betweens, the ins and outs. And, mm -hmm. and um, I just want to share some, some, some of my personal um, 
um, thoughts of being with my uncle. You know, it's like, um, you know, this is a man who taught me how to eat soup. <laughs> this is crazy. You take the spoon away from the bowl and have soup. You know, it's like, wow, I never knew that, you know. <laughs> and as a little boy, I used to uh, uh, stand to the side of the stage, right? When he would come to Chicago, play play the auditorium or any any uh, clubs he was playing, I could get in. It was a matinee. I mean, if it was a club, you know, I was a matinee. I could attend. But I remember the auditorium theater, and I remember standing off to the side and watching him, you know, play his horn. You know, the sound of you. And I was like mesmerized. I was like, wow. And it was incredible. Just that sound, that sound, that sound. So as I got older. You know, I was into hip. I mean, I was not hip hop. I was into to funk and and, and and the Beatles and uh, James Brown. But I got into jazz more and more and more and more and more and more. And and, uh, and then I would spend my summers in New York with him and being around him and and, and just listening to him and talking to him. And, and sometimes he would play the piano and I would ask him to play certain chords. And, oh, Miles, play this chord. Play this chord. Play. Man, it's beautiful. And and I was a sponge, still a sponge, to 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 take all this in, you know. I'm still I'm still a student of Miles. I, on my Facebook page, I say the University of Miles Davis. That's where I graduated, from, as many of us did, you know. And um, what an honor! What an honor! What an honor to be here, to talk to you, to be amongst this beautiful audience, and to um, speak on, on my uncle about my uncle. Um, I want to give some special thanks to people here. To my man Mark, uh, Mark Ruffin, 30 years or more from Chicago. Don was who I met at a, a Rolling Stones session. You were producing the Stones in the studio in LA with Daryl Jones. We grew up together basis with the Stones. Um, um, Ron Carter, the Ron Carter. <laughs> don't call him an anchor. You know what I mean? <laughs> Every time I call Ron, I hope you don't get mad when you see my call ID because I'm always saying, Ron, can you do this? Ron, can you do this? Ron, can you make this? But he, he always says, yeah, but I love you. I'll be there. Thanks, Ron. Mr. George Avakian, his wife said, I don't know if George can make it. I don't know if George can make it. George gets on the phone and says, Vince, I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks, George. Um... Evelyn from the Postal Service. My girl Evelyn. <laughs> we were, she put the whole program together. We were on the phone maybe three, four times a day, emails. Thank you, Evelyn. Mr. Ron. Now, I heard that the family's going to all get uh, VIP passes, so when the lines are real long in the post office, we just. <laughs> <laughs> march right to the front, right? <laughs> Oh, 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 yeah, the, the young trumpeters that are about to play. I reached out to a friend. His name is Carl Allen. He's the director of jazz at, at, at um, Juilliard. And I thought how fitting it would be to have young cats, trumpeters, play uh, each, 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 each uh, trumpeter play a Miles composition that they arranged. You know, I thought that would, you know, it was fantastic. So I called Carl. Carl says, hey man, I got, I got just the cats. So he emails me back. I didn't want to hear him, I just knew that these cats were the ones. And, and you're going to be in for a treat. Um, real quick, I want to thank Dar Daryl Porter, uh, Karen Sundell from Rogers and Collin, who helped us. She just works diligently for, for the family, for Miles Davis Properties. Uh, let me see, Anna Sala, Terry. Scott Souther, who books the, uh, the touring band that's going to tour in 2013-14. Uh, um, everybody, it, it, it's, it's an, an integral part to, to make this happen. And it was a team, a team effort. And I want to thank each and every one of you guys. And I got a quick story, and then I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. Another joke. Sister. <laughs> there was a club in Chicago, I don't know if you, some of you are familiar with, called the Sutherland. And my dad, Vincent Wilbur Sr., was a, uh, 
Prince, he's, he was an army, career army man. He was, everybody knew my dad, he passed away, God bless him. Um, military medals, shoes spit shine. He happened to, to, to go to a uh, club one night to see Uncle Miles. He got off work because he was, he, was he was a recruiter by that time after he, he got up in active service. So they were at a bar. So Uncle Miles looked at the bartender and said, Hey, give General Ridgeway another drink. He called him General Ridgeway. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're at this bar, right? Um, and some guy is talking to my dad about all his, his accolades. You know, like, man. And my dad's like, well, I fought in uh, the Battle of Normandy, and I fought in the Korean War, and, and um, I jumped out of airplanes, 82nd Airborne, black paratroopers, and, and I was a Buffalo soldier. So it was probably three, three wars, right? <laughs> true story, true story. So Miles looks at my dad and looks at the guy and says, Hey, she forgot about the fourth war. <laughs> so my dad said, Miles, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? He says, You married my sister. <laughs> Also thank um, Ms. Towns for that lovely anthem. Yeah. And Ms. Infantino for putting a smile on my face. <laughs> and uh, quickly, I just was uh, lately I've been thinking that I, I I live with my father, but I never got to meet his father. I was talking to Cheryl last night about it, and I was thinking this morning, like, what would it be like to see your own son on a stand, and, and mail somebody some correspondence or something with your own son on the stamp, and, you know, his father was a, was a dentist, and, uh, you know, he was a self-made man, and that's how uh, he was raised, and that's how I've been raised, and that's how the Davises are, we're, uh, we're very proud people, and this is a, a very high honor for us, and we, uh, we thank you all for coming. Thank you. Aaron, today is a beautiful, beautiful day for jazz and also the legacy of your father. What does this stamp mean to the Davis estate, the legacy, and the world of jazz music? Uh, well, it's, it's an honor to be, you know, to ha for him to have the stamp. And uh, I think it kind of solidifies his place in, you know, American history, if you will, like as far as 
you know, as far as having the stamp, you know, I mean, his music speaks for itself, you know, puts him in the place amongst the all-time greats of all musicians, but, you know, as far as, like, American history books, I think having a stamp kind of gives you that, uh, that last little nod of, you know, we think you're all right. <laughs> and, you know, we're, we're, we're tickled. You know, it's, all, it's awesome. <laughs> What's the thing you miss about your father? Oh, everything, man. Uh, I miss his humor. I miss uh, the fact that he didn't get to meet my daughter. I, you know, I miss the fact that I didn't get to show him the new lick I had today on guitar. You know what I mean? I miss everything. You know, I miss his cooking. I miss uh, watching the fights with him. I almost don't watch boxing anymore. But it's just not the same, you know, it's not the same without him picking apart every fighter and, you know, telling me what's happening. <laughs> this kind of feels like a dream. <laughs> Anyone else have this? This is a really, I, I had no idea what to expect coming here today. I, I knew I, I wouldn't miss it uh, for the world, but uh, I'm, I'm greatly honored to be here. And uh, it's, uh, this is amazing. It's mind-blowing that, that, that this has happened in our lifetime. Um, I didn't know Miles, never met him. I knew, knew his music intimately. And, uh, and when I was growing up uh, in, in Detroit, about a, about a mile away from where Mr. Carter grew up, uh, he, his music and his aesthetic had a tremendous impact on me as a young man. And that, that, I guess that's what I'd like to address today. Um, a couple years ago, I read a, a book uh, written by uh, the great basketball coach Phil Jackson called Sacred Hoops. And he really, he was writing about uh, coaching Michael Jordan and uh, the Chicago Bulls and how, how you deal with having a, a, virtu, a virtuoso player and, and how you can build a championship team around that. And it really required everyone to learn how to play team basketball. You pass a lot. You pay attention to uh, pay attention where your teammates are, and, and you stay focused. You you play in the moment. And the first thing I thought of was it, it really reminded me of uh, of the 1960s Miles Davis quintet with uh, you know with, uh, with Mr. Carter and Mr. Williams, you know, being the guards and and Herbie and Wayne forwards and Miles at the center. And even though Miles is a great virtuoso, this, this band passed the ball constantly. Uh, it was a, a musical conversation, and uh, it was ego-free, and it was beautiful. And and I, I tried to think about why why people love basketball and, and why they love to listen to Miles Davis, who who really did that not, not just with the quintet, but, but with all, all the groups that he played with. And I think it's because it's really metaphorical for the way that, that everybody aspires to live their lives. You, you wish your family was like that. You wish it was like that at work. You wish the, your community, the, the, the planet, was like that. And I think Miles was connected to the whole thing. You know, he, he was connected to life, uh, connected to the oneness of, of, of the universe, and yet. The dichotomy is that he was such an incredible, unique individual at the same time. There's nobody like him. And, and, to, and to make that your strength and yet be so connected to the life force, that's, that's something that, that's hard to do. That's, that's a tough, tough trick to pull off. And uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing it, it was probably difficult for Miles to maintain that all the time. It requires uh, tremendous focus. Tremendous attention and constant reminders. It's the same for any of us who try to emulate that that sensibility. Which brings us to to today. What an, an amazing reminder this is <laughs> that, that, that you can bring in your mail every day and look down and see Miles and, and be reminded of, of everything he stood for. It's not, it's not only a, a beautiful work of art and a, and a, a mind-blowing sociological uh, achievement, but it's just it's a beautiful message from Miles. Every time you look at the stamp, just to 
just to be cool and stay in the groove, right? <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. For having me. Thank you. We are gathered here. <laughs> Speak now or they ever hold your horn. Um, I met Miles in 1960 at a concert. So I've known him from then up until his passing. Um, and since I'm kind of in the New York area as a resident, I get the phone calls and the requests for interviews about Miles and the stories. Well, I explained to them I have some that I never share. Because the share of the mix of spirit kind of get a little further away. Miles is a person who always had something else to do. Uh, he and I were kind of the buddies in the band. Uh, he would call me up and say, come by the house, let's talk about some politics. He was very aware of the, the Harlem political ventures that were taking place, the you concept. He was a real sports fan. But I know he had something else to do. So he knew a lot of boxers, and when we would play Chicago or Philadelphia, all the famous boxers would come out to see him and like to get a chance to meet Johnny Bratton and people like that. But I know Miles had something else to do. He was aware of the financial market, so I had to get introduced me to some one of the early African American stockbrokers. I later I found out why they called them brokers. <laughs> But I knew Miles did something else. We would talk occasionally about, uh, well, he's a really athletically and, and, and interesting person. He liked to go to the golf course. Well, I wasn't interested in walking around in the green grass, man. I saw that in Detroit. So we would go to the driving range and just hit golf balls for about the hour. He was very interested in, in the African, in the Harlem literary society. So I got a chance to meet people who were really the great writers of the time, but I knew Miles did something else. He was very interested in design and the arts. And as my, wife, my, my late wife had a gallery, he would talk about painting, painters, how they did what they did. But I knew he did something else. He would call me up and say, we're working tomorrow at this club. Come back at the schedule, give it to the guys, and here's the deposit to spread around. I was kind of like the financial advisor of the band after the decisions were made. But I knew he did something else. He loved children. My two sons, Ron Jr. and Miles, were the wife. We'd go by his home with me for a rehearsal just to take a mile some food from the Spanish Cuban restaurant near our homes. He would tussle around with him, take him down to his gym and have a great time just horsing around with him. But I know he did something else. One of the things he would always do when we would his huge auditoriums with notification would always stand next to me. I know he did something else. And this I can remember, he never advised Wayne how to write. Or never told Herbie how to voice a chord. <coughs> or never told Tony how to play the drums. We were playing Autumn Leaves one night, and at the end of the chorus, it's a, a G. G minor chord. <coughs> well, on that chord, the high wind solo, I play the B natural. So after the chords went by, he walked by and said, what's that note? I said, B natural, and don't ask me again. <laughs> but I really did something else. When I first joined the band with Herbie Wayne and Tony and George, we went down we went down to 46th Street to Miles, his friend who owned an Italian men's shop. And there we bought four 
light denim blazers with our name across the chest. Medium blue shirts, dark blue ties, four tuxedos, and a sport jacket. We looked great. <laughs> but no Miles did something else. It always implied that every night we go to work is a chance to play some great music. But I know he did something else. And one of the concerts we did in Lincoln Center, my friend Valentine, it didn't almost get released because Miles was playing for a benefit core. He decided that he would donate our money to the cause. <laughs> <laughs> And since I was this much taller than Miles, <laughs> that was a pretty poor choice for him to do that to us. We've been off for three months, and he had, he had the audacity to donate our salary to your cause. He said, so? <laughs> well, my base case was nearby, so I put my base in case and headed toward the door. And he was that serious. So, oh yeah. So how about if, we, if I pay you double? Not enough. We worked it out and the results are two great records live in concerned with Billy Taylor as one of the MCs. But I knew Miles did something else. He often volunteered to do benefits or see if we were available or recommend someone from the, the committee putting together a benefit for CORE or SNCC or one of the fundraisers for those organizations. But I know he did something else. Actually, as I look back, he was two something else. He played trumpet. He was my friend. Thank you. Ron, this is a very, very important day for not just jazz, but just the legacy of Miles Davis. And also, you were part of that. How do you feel about this stamp? It's a momentous event. I'm happy that they have made it possible that you could go to the post office, buy an image of Miles Davis, and send it anywhere in the world. What is it about this stamp that's going to really open the world to just the legacy of Mr. Davis, as well as just what he brought to the world? I think any visual reminder of people, items, things, that kind of eyesight connection sticks up here and people wonder, well, who is this guy? I think that connection is very important to his name being very on the tip of people's tongues and available to have them go to the store and find out what this guy really did. Well, I just wish that I could be here for a couple of hours to talk about Miles as well. But I don't think that's really necessary, but I'm so delighted that by unusual coincidence, Edith Piaf and Miles Davis, two very different artists who were very good friends of mine, are being honored on the same day. I think this is a wonderful occasion to again the connection between Amer uh, American musicians and French musicians who collaborated in so many ways to get together and in their separate ways to establish a standard of excellence which will continue long for all of us gone. I'm sitting around because I want to reach my 94th birthday. <laughs> and I'll see you on my 95th birthday.
tell me about the importance of this evening's induction of the Edith Piaf and Miles Davis stamp forever. You know, I think we had a celebration of two, two legends, two giants, and Miles Davis is, has a personal connection for me because he's from my hometown, and my family know his family, so I had to be here to celebrate. What does Miles Davis mean to the world musically as well as spiritually? Because a lot of people listen to his music and are spiritually connected as well as they have a connection to him and what, he's, what he means to music. I think Miles Davis is a, um, a triumph of innovation. He's a man who never rested on any one style. He felt the challenge to constantly innovate the next generation of styles. And I think that it says to all of us that we are all challenged to reinvent ourselves, to constantly push to the next level. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Rubin Museum here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the PR family and the state as well as the Miles Davis family as well as the staff and management here at the Rubin Museum. As always, please visit my website, www.thepaceweport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.